Committee, and welcome to the 718-719 formal session of the uh, Salt Lake City Council, RDA, and local bids, bids, uh, excuse me, local building authority formal meeting. Welcome to today's Salt Lake City Council Combined Local Building Authority Redevelopment Agency and City Council meeting. We're happy to have you here join us today virtually and in person. We have a full house. Thank you for your patience as we continue navigating the COVID situation and trying to make the best decision to keep people safe. If you're here joining us in, on site, the council continues to take precautions to reduce the transmissions of COVID-19 and maintain a healthy work environment. For now, masks are no longer required in city facilities. However, anyone here in person who prefers to wear a mask uh, is welcome to do so. If you're here to give public comments, feel free to remove your mask after your name has been called and you are at a microphone to address the council. Thank you for uh, joining us. And our next item on the agenda is please stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we begin tonight's meeting, I want to make a distinction for the public's understanding to ensure we have a clear record. As the city's elected officials, I would like to highlight council members don't just serve on the city council, but we also serve as a local building authority board and the redevelopment agency board. Think of it as a council wearing three different hats. We will begin with the business tonight of the local building authority, and then we will change our hats and move on to uh, to one business item as a redevelopment agency board and then change our hats again to conduct the city council business items. Our business items tonight include the state required steps of adopting a tentative budget for each entity. As the uh, local building authority, we are uh, at the LBA unfinished business item B1 regarding a resolution that tentative, tentative budget for the capital project fund of the local building authority for fiscal year 2022 to 23. And I will look for a motion for this uh, adoption of this tentative budget. Mr. Mr. Chair, I move that the council approve the resolution adopting the tentative budget for the capital projects fund of the local building authority of Salt Lake City, Utah for fiscal year 22-23. Second. I have, a council, I have a, a motion from Councilmember Puy, a second from Councilmember Warden. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion on this item, I will roll call this Councilmember Fowler. Yes. Puy? Yes. Warden? Yes. Mono? Yes. Father Morris? Yes. Petro? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes unanimously 7 to 0. Now I will look for a motion to adjourn as a local building authority and to convene as a redevelopment agency board. No moved. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Wharton, a second from Councilmember Mono. Any discussion on this item? No discussion. I'll roll call this. Councilmember Fowler? Yes. Pui? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Mono? Yes. Olivares? Yes. Petro? Yes. And I'm a yes. That motion passes unanimously. We will now convene as the Redevelopment Agency Board. As a uh, Redevelopment Agency Board, we're at the unfinished business of item D1. And that's the resolution of the tentative budget for the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake City for fiscal year 2022 to 23. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the board approve a resolution adopting the tentative budget for the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake City for fiscal year 2022 to 23. Second. I have a motion for Councilmember Mano, second for Councilmember Puy. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussions, I will call this. Councilmember Petro? Yes. Father Morris? Yes. Mono? Yes. Warden? Yes. Pui? Yes. Flower? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes 7 to 0 unanimously. And that concludes our redevelopment agency board meeting. I look for a motion to adjourn. Who to adjourn? Second. A motion from Councilman Pui, a second from Councilman Warden. Any discussion? No discussion. Look for roll call, Bottle Morris? Yes. Mono? Yes. Warden? Yes. Bui? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Pichu? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes unanimously 7-0. We're now convened as a body of the Salt Lake City Council. 
and get into the meat of this here. And I look for, uh, first thing is the, uh, we won't go to the, the uh, business rules. We're going to go to the, the approval of the work session meeting, meeting minutes of February 8th, 2022, April 12th, 2022, April 19th, 2022, as well as the formal meeting minutes of October 5th, 2021, March 22nd, 2022, April 5th, 2022, and April 12th, 2022. So uh, moved. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Fowler, a second from Councilman Puy. Any discussion on this item? See no discussions. I will roll call this. Councilman Fowler? Yes. Puy? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Beecho? Yes. Alamores? Yes. Mono? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes uh, unanimously 7-0. Next, I have the honor and privilege of uh, presenting Mayor Menhall will present the final, the proposed Salt Lake City budget, including the library fund for fiscal year 22 to 23. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for joining me. Let me adjust a little bit. First, I want to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. Salt Lake City respects and recognizes the enduring relationship between many indigenous people and their ancestral homelands. And we respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, cities, states, and the federal government we cherish our partnership with the Native Nations and urban Indian communities and affirm our commitment to strengthening that connection in the years to come. Second, I want to thank all of the department directors and representatives of our city's departments and divisions who are joining us tonight. Thank you for taking the time to be here, all of you. And anybody from the public who's tuning in, thank you. I am grateful to be here with you tonight to present my fiscal year 2023 budget recommendation. This is my third budget speech, but it's the first time I'm joining you in person for this process as mayor, and I have to say I'm very happy to be here with you. And while yes, this is my third budget speech, this recommendation will be markedly different than the two before it. In fact, it's different from any budget that I saw while serving on the City Council. It is a multi-dimensional proposal that enables our city team to handle the service demands of the people living in our city. It positively impacts quality of life for our residents while also supporting our growing economy and our city infrastructure. I've been a part of budget decisions where our revenue was stagnant or in decline and we were limited in the choices that we could make. Today we find ourselves in a unique economic position with a growing economy, rising population, and inflation. But we also find ourselves at a position of never before seen demand for city services. We've known for many years that Salt Lake City is experiencing unprecedented growth. While our population has steadily increased to over 200,000 people, we know our daytime population balloons to more than 360,000 individuals, an 80% increase during business hours. Recent data from the Chem C. Gardner Policy Institute shows that 83% of people who have a job in Salt Lake City do not live in our city. That takes a toll on our roads, increased calls for service to our 911, police and fire departments, and additional challenges to our environment. In my first State of the City address as mayor, we talked about the realities of being a city with tremendous economic inertia, how we can best capture that potential, and the challenges we would face as a result of our city's growth. But with growth comes options and opportunity. And as we thought about how to utilize this growth for the good of all our residents, we didn't just look inward for those answers. We looked out to our communities. 
we reached out to our residents and we heard them loud and clear. In our annual resident survey, four out of five residents expressed their feelings that there's a high quality of life in Salt Lake City and more than 70% believe that we are headed in the right direction. Additionally, almost 80% of residents expressed an interest in a future investment in our infrastructure. Despite the crises of the past couple years, the highest priorities for our residents have remained quite constant. They want us to invest in affordable housing programs, expand opportunities to improve air and water quality, and increase investments in our parks and public lands. While the growth here is exciting in many ways, Salt Lake City is facing the same challenges that many of our community's business owners have experienced in recent months. The rising cost of labor, the shortage of available workforce, and inflation across the board, which is affecting everyone. Over the past several years, even before the pandemic, we've experienced growth in work and service demand in every department and division in our city government. Our employees have been stretching, reimagining, and adapting their work to accommodate the growing needs and the potential that our residents have been bringing to us. Salt Lake City employees are amazing. They are committed and they are passionate about meeting the needs and making the potential possible. That's why the focus of my administration has been our growth, our environment, our community, and our city family. And residents are asking our city family to grow to accommodate their needs. We've all heard that expression, small lake city. And for so long, when you'd meet someone new here, you could spend less than 10 minutes figuring out your mutual connections or which of their family members went to high school with you. I've, as we've seen our city and our state population grow more than ever, as locals we know that it's less and less often we get to make those one degree removed connections. We see and feel and know the growth all around us. Salt Lake City is growing up. And it's my job to bring you, the City Council, and all the people we represent a financial path forward that reflects the realities that we're working with a path that's responsible, prudent, and proactive in its approach. Most of all, one that supports the opportunities our amazing residents and local businesses are asking us to help them reach. Tonight, I offer you that path forward. I'm recommending a general fund budget for the next fiscal year of $368 million. It marks a 1.85 percent increase in our fund balance from fiscal year 21, which was the last pre-pandemic budget. And the benefits to our residents and businesses will be significant and wide-reaching. In this budget, you'll see four main themes that reflect our city priorities. Decreasing Salt Lake City's cost of living and reducing the risk of homelessness through the creation of more affordable and deeply affordable housing and better transit options making Salt Lake City safer by supporting our 911 police and fire departments at the level residents need and expect, making Salt Lake City more sustainable and improving our quality of life through investments in our parks, trails, and open space, and opportunities to clean our air, and finally, investing in our city family to support them and the amazing work they do every day. One of the primary goals laid out in this budget is affordable and deeply affordable housing. Our residents who are homeless are always at the forefront of our minds and our work. As the impacts of the nation's fastest growing state population and the pandemic have exacerbated the homelessness crisis across Utah. The strain on homeless resource centers and overflow shelter locations has grown. Last year, I called for the cooperation of other cities and all levels of government to solve for this statewide humanitarian crisis. I fought for Salt Lake City to receive guaranteed dollars from the state to address the impacts on neighborhoods from the homeless resource centers they host. And I advocated for the state to put real money into affordable housing development. I'm grateful for the increased cooperation of other cities in our county 
and for the funding our city will finally receive this year to mitigate some of the impacts that we carry. But the homeless resource system needs to serve more people. I hear the calls for action and I stand with our residents. We must do better. We must do more. But the city cannot act alone. Salt Lake City will continue to be a leader in addressing homelessness and investing in affordable housing. We'll continue to invest in access to resources, public health, and safety solutions. I'm excited to propose ongoing funding for the Downtown Ambassadors Program and the new rapid intervention team that will be able to quickly respond to residents and businesses that are experiencing issues related to unsheltered camping in their neighborhoods. We will also renew our contract for the on-street outreach team at Volunteers of America. As of last year, millennials outnumber baby boomers as the largest population demographic in this country, and the struggle for younger residents to purchase a home or find access to affordable housing is very real. Six years ago, we made a massive invest in, investment in affordable housing, putting nearly $20 million together to dramatically expand affordable housing opportunities. It's time we do that again. In this budget, between two city departments, we've put together $21 million for affordable and deeply affordable housing, which can create 1,000 affordable units for our residents. I'm proposing that the majority of those be prioritized for extremely low income households with a focus on people and families experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness and for essential service workers like our firefighters, police, teachers and librarians. This is not only an investment in housing stock, it's an investment for our residents who are facing housing instability and those who may be unhoused today. Everyone deserves a safe, warm place to sleep that they can afford. I feel passionately about this, and I know you do as our city council. In this budget, we can bring a massive lift to the housing crisis in this city. If adopted, this budget will make significant investments in public safety as well, which is a priority I know that we all share and we've made great strides in. Crime is down 15% in Salt Lake City year to date, but this work is never done. Thanks to on the ongoing work of the Racial Equity and Policing Commission, Salt Lake City continues to explore how we think about public safety. And in this budget, you'll see the commission's recommendations reflected yet again. We'll hire an additional 22 employees in our police department, the majority of whom will be civilian positions. These additions will add capacity to our victim advocates and a civilian response team. We are also adding a position specifically to enhance our department's outreach and recruitment in our historically diverse communities. I know these positions will improve our public safety. They'll reduce strain on our officers who are responding to more calls than ever before. And they'll also positively grow our community relationship with our police department. I want to sincerely thank our police department for their continued commitment to keeping our residents and visitors safe. Salt Lake City will continue to be competitive in our compensation structure for our first responders because we want the best. Our residents deserve the best. Last year, with the support of the City Council and in response to the high demand and increasing difficulty of their jobs, the City gave a historic wage increase to our law enforcement this year, in order to maintain Salt Lake City's position as a wage leader in public safety, we are proposing a 3.5% increase for all police officers, with an additional 6% increase for our most experienced top step officers. This budget will also allow our fire department to hire an additional 10 firefighters to help support the demand that they are seeing. It also call, calls for the activation of additional medical response teams, which, which serve all our residents and oftentimes those who are the most vulnerable. Demands on every department and division have increased in recent years. While we have maintained operationally lean and have budgeted conservatively, given the tremendous growth that we're bearing, 
My budget approach this year remains prudent and conservative. I'm asking for investments in projects that will make Salt Lake City a more sustainable city and importantly, improve our air quality. In fact, this year's budget committee placed an emphasis on air quality in every decision that they made. This is seen across a spectrum of proposals in this year's budget from our second south reconstruction project that now allows for more bike travel, increased pedestrian walk walkways, and new landscaping trees on Utah's busiest transit street to investments in our new park ranger program. I believe it's important to think of our environment, whether we're budgeting for transportation needs or our capital improvement requests. We will always stretch every dollar and keep the city budget as lean as we can, but we cannot ignore the fact that additional revenue is needed to meet the growing demands. In this budget, I'm proposing creative new ways to harness revenue the city is already receiving, as well as new sources that, if adopted, will produce benefits to every resident's quality of life. The multidimensional part of this budget comes in the form of new additional revenue generation that's necessary for our services to meet the public's demand. In addition, I'm proposing the creation of a fifth bucket of funding our future, which will support the ongoing maintenance needs of our existing parks and open space. These are critical needs that the city must address. Salt Lake City residents are known for our deep commitment and our, our deep connection and our commitment to our public lands and our precious green spaces. In polling from just three weeks ago, 70% of our residents supported investing new tax dollars in our open spaces. Tonight, I'm excited to propose an initiative to reimagine nature a general obligation bond to be placed on the ballot this fall for our voters to decide. I'm seeking an $80 million investment that will be transformative for our public lands, our parks, and our urban trails. In this proposal, you'll see major investments for the Glendale Regional Park, the Jordan River Corridor, Liberty Park, Allen Park, the Folsom Trail, Fleet Block, and seven other neighborhood parks throughout the city. These projects will work to improve our air quality and water quality by increasing biodiversity and planting more trees and vegetation. With this voter approved investment, we'll be able to answer our residents' call for more access, connectivity, and ongoing care to our treasured green spaces. The projects that we've selected were guided by the Reimagine Nature Master Plan, which was built with our community and that you just recently approved. The projects were chosen based on equity, access, and positive impacts to our air and water quality. We can use this bond money to make citywide improvements to our parks and open spaces, but we need an ongoing and sustainable way to care for and maintain those assets. City residents have made it clear that taking care of their assets, their investments, now and in the future, is important to them. So to this end, this budget proposes an ongoing commitment to parks and public lands maintenance through the new growth portion of our funding our future. This is a $2 million ongoing investment that will be funded from our existing additional growth in our sales tax revenue at no new cost to residents. Also included in this year's budget are my plans to invest $63 million in already existing bond capacity since the city recently paid off a 25-year bond for the Steiner Ice Sheet. Putting that current capacity to use will not, will not create any new tax burden on our residents, but it will create real and visible progress on projects that are important to all of us. With the sales tax bond, residents will soon see quiet zones near railroad crossings, improvements to Pioneer Park, to our Warm Springs Park building, and Fisher Mansion, among many other investments. And you all know that construction began several years ago on a new $830 million water reclamation facility to replace our existing treatment center, which is now reaching the end of its lifespan. At nearly 55 years old, this project was not only needed, but it was required by the federal government, and it will come online in January of 2025. 
Back in 2015, public utilities initiated a gradual rate increase that the City Council has consistently approved. And that rate increase proposal, as you heard earlier today, continues this year so that we can maintain that necessary work. During significant public engagement, residents made it clear that they prefer gradual increases over several years as we've been doing instead of a significant one-time jump in rates. So residents will soon see a postcard in the mail detailing this year's planned increase for public utilities. In my budget, I'm proposing that we quadruple the public utilities assistance fund to make sure that more families than ever before can reach that assistance. As we discuss growth and how to best harness it as a city government, I've taken a hard look at where we've been and I find myself looking back to 2014. When I began serving on the city council that year, <clears throat> the median price of a home in Salt Lake City was $288,000. I'm just gonna let that sit with you while I take a sip. Today, it's nearly $520,000. Salt Lake City hasn't raised property taxes in those eight years. We've been really fortunate. The council, my predecessors, and I have been careful stewards of our city's budget, and we've been able to deliver extraordinary service to our taxpayers without an increase. Inflation, increased labor costs, and most notably, the stunning increase in demand for city services has led me through careful consideration to request your support for a property tax increase equivalent to about $10 per month on the median priced home in Salt Lake City. As leaders, it's our responsibility to make difficult decisions like this. Inflation has taken its toll not just on our city's business owners and residents, but also our city government. It's an important part of this discussion because as inflation rises nationwide and impacts all of our residents, it also equates to increased costs for our government to operate. The consumer price index for all urban consumers was up 8.5% over the last 12 months. Here in our city corporation, we feel these costs, but the costs have also been compounded by an increase in demands for city services. I look at our building services division, which is currently experiencing one of the most sharply rising areas of demand within the city. In the past year alone, valuation of permits processed have doubled from $1.4 billion to $2.8 billion. At the new Salt Lake City International Airport, we project that by the end of fiscal year 23, we will set a new record for passengers flying out of or through Salt Lake City at more than 27 million people. In 2014, that number was 21 million. We're also not immune to the growing impacts and dangers of climate change and the enduring drought suffocating the Western United States. Last August, the human-caused Parley's Canyon wildfire threatened one of our most important municipal watersheds. We're in the midst of the worst mega drought in 1,200 years, while we're also supporting the largest population that has ever called our city home. And while overall crime is down 15% year to date, our 911 police and fire departments are fielding more calls for service than ever before. In 2014, Salt Lake City Police Department received 90,000 calls for service. Last year, they received 127,000. 43% of our residents are using our parks more frequently since the pandemic began, and our trails are being used 41% more frequently. That's awesome. <laughs> These are just a few examples of a long building growth that have been working to serve and meet the needs that we've been working to serve and meet the needs of. For the past many years, we've been fortunate to ad adapt our budgets analyze and squeeze every nickel we could to serve our residents. And we've done great things, even with the crises of the past two years. I've been debating this decision for months. But as we forecast in future years, it's clear that a 4.9% property tax increase now is necessary to avoid a much larger increase down the road when our demands will be even higher. 
Raising taxes is always a tough, tough choice. But the longer that we choose to save money by not doing the critical work that needs to be done, by not hiring enough people or paying enough good wages to work on our streets and maintain our parks, the further we will fall behind in doing the business that our residents expect and need us to do, and the more it will cost us to catch up. I know the question will be, why increase taxes when we're seeing increased sales tax revenue and we received recent federal money for pandemic relief? This is a serious question and deserves a clear answer. We were so fortunate to have had federal CARES dollars and President Biden's rescue plan dollars come in as one-time support to help fill the gaps in revenue that we suffered during the last two years, and importantly, to help our residents and our businesses get the support they desperately needed. And though some revenues have increased, they have not risen at the same pace as the demands uh, are on our city. One-time federal funding and recently increased sales tax receipts have been critical, but they don't provide the stable source of funding we will need as we project into the future. This moderate tax increase now will prevent us from being faced with needing to do a larger increase down the road. And let me be clear for our residents, this 4.9% increase is only for the city's portion of your total property tax. Salt Lake City receives and sets the rate for less than one third of the total, with schools, the county, and other taxing entities making up the majority. If this budget's adopted, we'll have the ability to provide increased access to affordable housing, a safer community, and the ability to do the jobs that residents are asking us to do. Our city family is truly the heartbeat of Salt Lake City. They keep our roads paved, our water running, and our community safe. The benefits of this proposal will be widespread and will have significant impacts on our community as we meet the needs of our diverse and expanding capital city. This will bring us to the next level to serve our residents better. We will add employees to departments that are struggling today to keep up with the needs of our residents. We'll exchange more gas-powered city lawnmowers for electric ones. We'll continue to invest in Tech Lake City, creating job opportunities and increasing economic mobility. We'll invest in cybersecurity needs that keep our city and our residents safer. And perhaps my favorite part of this budget is the expansion of the city's Hive Pass to utilize that funding for all children in K through 12 schools to have access to public transit every kid. This helps our air quality and it lessens the transportation burden on our families. This proposal is about structuring our government and our public spaces to embrace the potential that we are facing. This is a catalyst to making our city safer, greener, and ultimately better. Our city is in high demand and with these investments we will be better able to shape the growth for the good of our residents. And what do they want? Safety, stability, and they want opportunity. They want to connect with joy, to connect with nature, and to connect with each other. We're good at serving these needs in Salt Lake City, and we are going to be better. History is filled with governments acting as a passenger in times of growth and economic success, and the driver in times of economic stagnation. Let's transform the discussion to move from the growth that's happening to us to making choices that will allow us to get the most good out of it. Let's take the wheel and shape the future that our residents want. Thank you for your support and for your careful consideration of my 2023 budget proposal. I look forward to working with you over the next nearly two months to enact a budget that levels up our city in a way that is resilient and responsible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. I appreciate that. As many as you know, the council will spend the next several weeks receiving briefings and discussing the proposed budget before we're ready to adopt the final budget in June. We're required to do it by the 1st of July. We invite members of the public 
to tune into these budget briefings and to share your inputs and feedbacks on all these issues. We have a lot of work ahead of us, and we thank you, Mayor, for your uh, homework and your staff for preparing this thoughtful recommended budget. We will now uh, begin our public hearing process. Taylor Hill on our staff will be calling the names of those who wish to comment. We will call names of people joining our WebEx and in person based on the order of rec registration or received comment cards. Once we open the public comment, Taylor will announce three names at a time so that people can have some notice and be prepared to speak. When it's your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name, and for people on WebEx, she will unmute your line and you may begin. For people in person, please step up to the podium to make your comments into the microphone. Once you begin, please state your name and the two-minute timer will start. At the two-minute mark, the staff will announce time. If you're unable to finish your comments, please send the rest of your comments via email, mail, or call our office. Our contact information is posted in the meeting room or on the WebEx chat. If you know, do not wish to speak, please either message our staff or when our staff states your name, please let us know you are here to listen. Our first uh, public hearing item is G1 in regarding to the grant applications of 2023 Distracted Driving Prevention Program Grant. And these are for the public comments. So Taylor, do we have any public comments for the grant? Council Chair, we do not have anyone here for this item. Okay. I will look for a motion on this grant. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and refer item G1 to a future consent agenda for action. Second. I have a motion from Councilor Petro, second from Council Mono. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion on this item, I will roll call this. Councilman Fowler? Yes. Pui? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Mono? Yes. Bolomors? Yes. Pichu? Yes. And I'm a yes. <clears throat> that, mo that most impassions unanimously. We will move on to item number G3, Ordinance Rezoning the Master Plan Amendment at 1902 South, 400 East. Before taking comments, I, have a, I can turn it over to. Sorry, Council Chair, did you intend to go past? Yeah, we the missed public hearing G two, which is the rezone on West Temple. I did. Sorry, missed it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. I missed G two. <laughs> The yeah, ordinance rezoning the master plan amendment at 1950 Southwest Temple, 1948 Southwest Temple. And before we take any comments, I'm going to turn the time over to Brian Fulmer to uh, give us a short introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This proposal is to amend the zoning map for property at 1950 Southwest Temple and a portion of the property located at 1948 Southwest Temple, where Intermountain Wood Products is located. The larger parcel at 1948 South is split zoned between RMF 35, which is moderate density, multifamily residential, and CG or general commercial. The 1950 South parcel is zoned RMF 35. Uniform CG zoning would help facilitate the applicant's desire to construct a new office building and expand storage space. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And Taylor, uh, open up for comments. Council Chair, we have one person to speak to this item, and that is George Chapman. George, you are unmuted. Okay, uh, good evening, Council. I urge you not to approve the rezone. The problem is it's a lumber company and theoretically they could increase uh, noise significantly right across the street from single family homes. This expansion of the commercial zoning on that corner impacts the homes that are right across the street. This is a quiet, West Temple in that area is a quiet walkable area in my opinion and this rezone will increase traffic 
in and out of that street that should be continue to be a quiet single family home street. The height is also a concern since again it it's a home neighborhood. It's not a high density high height area. It should be one or two story homes. And I think single family home areas like this deserve protection from the increased traffic that this rezone will create. So I urge you not to allow the rezone and and stop the increased traffic on this single family home, quiet, bikeable, walkable street. Those are my comments. Thanks for listening. Thank you, George. And Taylor, that was our only commenter. That's correct. Thank you. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair. I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. And I further move that the council direct staff to work with the petitioner and the city's attorney office to prepare a development agreement for future consideration that will limit building height on the property to 35 feet maximum. Second. I have a, I have a motion from Councilman Mono, a second from Councilman Pui. Any discussion on this item? See no discussions. I will roll call this. Council Member Petro. Yes. Mother Morris? Yes. Mono? Yes. Warden? Yes. Pui? Yes. Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously 7-0. We will now move on to item number three, the rezone and master plan amendment at 1902 South 400 East. And before I uh, open it for the comments, I'm turning the time over to Brian Fulmer. Brian Sawyers for a short introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This proposal would amend the central community master plan future land use map for property located at 1902 South 400 East from low density residential to medium density residential and amend the zoning map from R1 5000 residential to RMF 35 or moderate density multifamily residential district. The stated purpose of the rezone request is to facilitate construction of townhomes. This, a historic home was on the property that suffered catastrophic damage during, during the March 2020 earthquake and has since been removed. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Taylor. Council Chair, there are two people here to speak to this item. The first will be Caitlin Tubbs, followed by George Chapman. Caitlin, you are now unmuted. Thank you, Taylor. Good evening, Council. Thank you for having this on the agenda. I am a member of the planning staff, and I'm just going to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Caitlin. And we will move on to George Chapman. George, you are now unmuted. Okay. Um, this is a really serious issue right now. Uh, 1902 South 400 East is a very, very important piece of property. Um, a single family home in this area might rent for 2000 maybe 3000 a month at the most. And what you're proposing to do with this rezone is increase housing costs 400% minimum because if you put in eight townhomes, it could be worth $450,000. If they're not affordable, $450,000 is not affordable. If you put eight of them in, that each of those owners will be paying over 4000 a month in loan, uh, uh, property tax, uh, and utilities, 4000 a month when before it was like two or 3,000 a month. That's at least a 400,000, 400% increase in housing. That's what you're going to have happen because there are a lot of other lots right next to it, right across the street that are also large lots that could handle what you're proposing on this. Every other lot in the area is gonna to wanna to increase density eight times and increasing density eight times in a, on a street that was designed for low density single family home neighborhood doesn't make sense. It destroys the, the quiet street that 
quiet streets that are bikeable and walkable. And 400 East was walkable, was bikeable safely, and traffic is increasing seriously because we're increasing density where it shouldn't be increased. So I urge you not to approve this, not to increase housing costs 400%, not to open the door to uh, 20 or 30 other lots in the area. Thank you, George. And that's our final comment for this item. Oh, you submitted a card? If you've submitted a card, then go right ahead, sir. Oh, uh, uh, oh. Taylor, we have one in, in person here. Go ahead, sir. My name is Jeff Bear, and I live across the street from this property. After the loss of the Sears home, the owners subdivided the lot into two parcels with a plan to build their new home on the corner, and their friends would build a home on the adjacent lot. When they realized that it would take two years to work through planning the Salt Lake City, they abandoned and decided to sell the properties. This developer has used that plan for doubling the density to argue for their plan to cram eight townhomes onto the property, building edge to edge on the lot. Two homes to eight townhomes is a major stretch and their argument is both disingenuous and dishonest. Let's be serious, These aren't afford this isn't affordable housing, this is luxury housing. <clears throat> Their motivation is pure profit, and once the units are sold, the developer leaves the neighborhood, and we're left to deal with the negative impacts. I'm not opposed to increased density, but the developer's plan is over the top. Three townhomes on the lot should be the maximum, and there should be some communal shared space, even a business area for dogs. There is nothing like that in their plans. Developers also use the villa senior apartments across the street to argue for their plan. I was in the council chamber <clears throat> when the city council unanimously voted against another higher density development only a block from the Sears lot. In that denial, several council members specifically cited the villa apartment building on 400 East in their denial, and councilman and architect Simon, Soren Simonson even called that building, quote, a bad neighbor, close quote. Just over a year ago, the Brookings Institute issued a report titled, Gentle Density Can Save Our Neighborhoods. I urge the council to consider gentle density and deny the motion for the zoning amendment and prevent another bad neighbor from denigrating our community and neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. And Taylor, I think that is our last commenter on that item. Yep, that's correct. <clears throat> Staff, I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to future council meeting. Second. A motion from council member Poy, second from council member Fowler. Any discussion on this item? Okay, I'll roll call this. Council member Petro? Yes. Father Morris? Yes. <clears throat> Mono? Yes. Morton? Yes. Puy? Yes. Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes. That motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to item number four, the ordinance library budget amendment number one for fiscal year 2021 to 22. And before we take any comments, I will turn it over time over to uh, Ben Lucky for a short introduction. There is one item in the library budget amendment. The library is required to account for half a million dollars in pass-through property taxes that are going to the Utah Inland Port and the County Convention Center Hotel. This is an annual pass-through that is required by the state. The fiscal year 23 annual budget includes an amount that should avoid uh, the need for a budget amendment next fiscal year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ben. And Taylor, I'll open up the comments. There is no one here to speak to this item. Okay, thank you. I will look for a motion. I move that the council continue the public hearing to a future date. Second. I have a motion from Councilor Pedro, second from Councilor Wharton. Any discussion on this item? I said with such confidence, I was moved to. <laughs> 
second it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll roll call this. I don't need it. It's, it's about the substance, not the technique. All right. <laughs> Councilman Fowler. Yes. Bury. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Picho. Yes. Palomos. Yes. Mano. Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes seven to zero unanimously. Move on to item number five, which is ordinance to budget amendment number seven for fiscal year 2021 to 22. And I will turn the time over again to Ben to give us a short introduction. The city budget amendment number seven has 27 items totaling $24 million. Two of the largest items are $2.8 million to transfer the housing trust fund to the redevelopment agency. And $2.2 million from a state grant for floodplain mitigation in and around the Granary District to the Jordan River. There is also one item for a cybersecurity improvements, which would be one new full time employee. The administration's proposal, the council staff report, and all of the related documents are in today's packet. The council's budget website is tinyurl.com forward slash SLC FY22 budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ben and Taylor. Council Chair, there are two people here to speak to this item. The first will be Mabel Stevens and then George Chapman. Hi, good evening. I'm Maeve from Utah Open Lands, and I'll speak to the quality of life portion of the budget amendment. Utah Open Lands is happy to support city environmental goals via our landowner relationships and urges the, that the budget amendment be approved. Uh, I'd like to share briefly the primary conservation values present on a local open space property featured in the budget. The property primarily represents ecological values, supporting air and water quality and providing a valuable native plant seed bank for Salt Lake City. The property is also adjacent to local and federal protected lands, extending the quantity of open space and enhancing important wildlife migration corridors. Finally, I'd like to underscore the very pristine wild nature of this open space, which has been accomplished through decades of stewardship by the landowner. Thank you very much. Thank you, May. And next we will hear from George Chapman. George, you are unmuted. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the mobile cop cams. Um, you should consider more light pole cameras and maybe using 5G towers for the cameras. There's a maintenance co an operation cost increase that's not in the budget. And so just because you buy the trailers doesn't make sense that the city doesn't budget for monitoring them with personnel, even if it's just 911 dispatch or civilians. Uh, the high crime areas around the shelters and VOA and Pioneer Park and Jefferson Park deserve priority and your discussion this afternoon made sense. Um, and on another issue in the budget uh, amendment, uh, the Granary Floodplain Mitigation Fund should be used, uh, that's over $4 million, it should be used for the, uh, make the fleet block a park. That's perfect for flood mitigation. And finally, the east side $30 million precinct should have higher priority. We've been going around and around for almost 10 years on this. The east side really does need a precinct uh, for efficiency and cost savings. Those are my comments. Thank you, George. And that was the final comment for this item. Thank you, Taylor. Mr. Chair. I move that the council close the public hearing and adopt an ordinance amending uh, FY 2021-2022 final budget of Salt Lake City, including the employment staffing document only for the items as shown on the motion sheet. And do I have a second? Second. Second. Not at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a motion from Council Pui and a second from Councilmember Warden. Mm -hmm. Any discussion on this item? Councilman Romano? Yes. Bala Morris? Yes. Pichol? Yes. Horton? Yes. Pui? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Nama, yes. That passes unanimously.
council chair. Thank you. That small button. <laughs> Moving on to item H, the potential action items. We're now at the potential action items of our agenda. Item H1 is regarding an ordinance of public land 20 year master plan reimagine nature. I will look for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the council uh, defer action on the Salt Lake City Reimagine Nature Master Plan for a future meeting. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Wharton, a second from Councilmember uh, Mono. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will uh, roll call it. Councilmember Petro? Yes. Paula Morris? Yes. Mono? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Pui? Yes. Wharton? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes unanimously. We are now at our comments period, and this is comments to the uh, City Council. We're at the general comments portion of our agenda for comments about general topics and items that were not scheduled for a hearing tonight. I went over the City Council rules at the quorum earlier, and those rules apply here still. Uh, we are accepting your comments in person and through the WebEx for those joining virtually. And for those who are only options to call in, staff is monitoring a separate telephone line. Isaac Canedo is from our staff is helping to moderate the meeting and what can message with attendees if you need uh, to coordinate. Taylor Hill on our staff will be calling the names of those who wish to comment based on the order of registration or received comment cards. Once we open the public comment, Taylor will announce three names at a time so that people can have some notice to be prepared to speak. With your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name. For the people in WebEx, you will unmute your line and you may begin. For people in person, please step up to the podium to make your comments into the microphone. Once you begin, please state your name and the two-minute timer will start. The two-minute mark, the host will announce time and your microphone will be muted. If you're unable to finish your comments, please send your rest of your comments uh, by email or call our office. Our contact information is posted in the meeting room or in the WebEx chat. If you do not wish to speak, please either message our staff or when the host states your name, please let us know that you're here to listen. Taylor, you can begin with the first commenter. Council Chair, it looks like there are seven people here to speak to general comment. The first will be Keiko Jones, followed by Lindsay Bateman, and then Catherine Stewart. And Taylor, do you, Keiko, also, you, Taylor, do you also have the uh, two commenters here in the uh, present? Yes, Catherine is there in person as well as the following person. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, Keiko, you're now unmuted. Thank you. Hi, my name is Keiko, and I'm an executive board member of Fair Park Community Council. I live in the Guadalupe neighborhood, which is a small neighborhood that actually belongs to District 3 at the east edge of Fair Park Community. As you know, currently, Fair Park Community has three districts in its boundaries, districts one, two, and three, and it's not ridiculous at all, and I'll tell you why. Looking at the six maps, however you divide the city, it will put this very small community at the edge of district one, two, or three. Our concerns as the community are different from the majority of any of those districts. But at the same time, we are located in the middle of the issues that gather from all three districts. For example, we deal with off-street parking issue. That may not be an issue in Rose Park or West Point or Glendale, but Marmalade may have the similar issue. We deal with encampments, which may not be an issue in Federal Heights or avenues, but they may have the same issue in Poplar Grove. We need strong representation that doesn't go only with major issues in those districts. Also, some residents have been working hard with three wonderful city council members, Victoria, Allen, and Chris, beyond the community council boundaries to improve the west side. Losing any one of them would be like pulling the rug out from under our feet. On behalf of Fair Park Community Council, I ask you to vote for the minimal changes. Thank you. Thank you, Keiko. And next we will hear from Lindsay Bateman, followed by Catherine Stewart and then Josh Stewart. 
Lindsay, you are now unmuted. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Lindsay Bateman. I am a resident of Utah and I'm currently a student in the social work program at the University of Utah. As part of one of my courses, I administered a small survey about financial stability to residents in Utah. I found that one third of individuals felt they were not prepared to make financial decisions when entering adulthood. Many also suggested that providing more educational classes and material that would be beneficial in helping obtain financial security. The two largest areas of concern were not knowing how to manage debt and how to build savings. After the COVID pandemic and current inflation crisis, I felt that financial stability is an extremely important issue. I would like to suggest that additional education and material regarding these matters be made available and more known to the public than they are now. Thank you so much for your time. That is all I have. Thank you, Lizzie. And next will be Catherine Stewart, followed by Josh Stewart and then George Chapman. Catherine is in person to speak. To, I'm Catherine Stewart. To help avoid increasing amounts of screen time, children and youth need fun outdoor activities now more than ever. The Salt Lake City's children need a, an outdoor water park to inspire and motivate them to get out, get out of the house and have fun, socialize and get some exercise. The Seven Peaks or Raging Waters Water Park site should continue as a water park in some form for the good of families, children, and youth in the city. It is located on Salt Lake's west side, providing convenient access to low and middle income families. Many youth face challenge, challenges that are associated with the lack of exercise and outdoor play. Water parks bring fun to children who may never have a chance to visit the beach or play in some waves. The earlier that a child starts getting in shape, the more they'll reduce the risk of numerous illnesses. It is vital that children associate outdoor exercise with fun. For children to develop lifetime habits of healthy living, children need to know that outdoor activity can be an exercise can be fun and exciting, not just the drudgery of a PE class or highly competitive athletics. Water parks can challenge children and youth in a safer environment where they can learn about positive risk and reward. When so many sports have barriers to entry, like skill level, cost of equipment, or access, water parks can bring families together in a place where all ages, girls and boys, can exercise and have fun together. With streamlined maintenance and operations, as well as efficient water use, the, the city can make use of the site that it already has a significant infrastructure available. The water park does not need to be the most elaborate or use more water than is available, but it can have a wave pool and a few slides for families in the hot summer season. These facilities can provide a safe, non-competitive physical activity option that is more important for children and youth. Please make children's physical and emotional health a priority and keep a water park. Uh, Thank you, Catherine. She, you had me at drudgery of PE class. Thank you. <laughs> Josh okay. Stewart, followed by George Chapman, and then Christopher Butler. Okay, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, water park item as well. I, I know you had a work session earlier today and talked about it. I wanted to talk a little bit about that process. So I, as I did the survey, basically it looked kind of predetermined what was going to happen. So there was two parks and you could pick which one. It was basically, do you want a red pavilion or a blue pavilion? It wasn't like, do you want a sick water park or do you want a splash pad for little kids, right? So what we need is something to get kids out of the, uh, from not what watching their screens and teenage kids to get out and exercise. I mean, many of you probably went to Raging Waters as kids and it was awesome. I mean, those are what memories about what kids are all about. And maybe liberal democracy can't run a water park. Maybe we've got to have a private partnership where, you know, we've got to work together with some private partnerships to make something happen. And it's got to be thrilling. It's got to be exciting. You've got refugee kids that live right across the street. You could have them working there as lifeguards or it's concessions. I mean, it's a, you, they can walk right across the street. I mean, the mayor wants to give public passes to every kid to ride the public transit, but where are they gonna go? 
I mean, give them some place to go. Give them a, a water park where they can go. I mean, where, where else are you going to go? We lose this regional draw and, and you have, you know, a lot of trees. We'll go out and see the open space kids. That'll be really fun for you. Well, that's not what kids want. And, and there's plenty of open space along the Jordan River. I mean, I jog along it all the time. So we talk about equity. Well, you know, all the East, West Side kids already have the indignity of having to go to East High, right? Go across the valley. Well, let's give the West Side something that's a draw over here and, and something that's exciting and, and, and a draw. You know, we don't need another Liberty Park or Sugar House Park. We need we need something that's like exciting. Okay. Um, I think uh, let's not let maintenance and operations drive it and or let water scarcity drive it because okay. I th there's ways we can f figure that out and make sure like the water's uh, going to be there. Okay. Um, that's time. That's time. time. Anyway, we'll work with maybe some health and, and Catherine commented on the health stuff. So anyway, thanks. All right. Thank you, Josh. And now we will hear from George Chapman, followed by Christopher Butler, and then Paul Doland. George, you're now unmuted. Okay, um, I agree with the two previous speakers. Uh, Glendale deserves to have a swimming pool. If you really want to be respectful for the west side, you should ensure that there's another swimming pool, um, especially an outdoor one. Uh, a big one, I mean, Steiner's on the east side, uh, all the nice amenities are on the east side, and that's wrong. So I agree a swimming pool is necessary. I also agree that the city surveys keep limiting survey responses, and that's been consistent on all of the surveys, and that's wrong, and I think the city is collecting bad information because of those surveys. And finally, again, uh, city is effectively redlining the west side because, uh, well, it results in lack of grocery stores and a decrease in population. And it's, I can argue that it's because the city is not allowing development of tens of thousands of acres on the west side for housing and mixed use. That results also in a serious lack of affordable housing. If you want more grocery stores on the west side, if you want more amenities on the west side, you need to have more population on the west side. And the only way to get that is with more housing. So why isn't there more housing allowed on the west side? Tens of thousands of acres, you won't allow for housing. So I'm asking you to be more respectful to the west side, stop the uh, inadvertent but effective redlining on the west side, and allow more housing. Thanks for listening. Thank you, George. And now we will hear from Christopher Butler, followed by Paul Dolent. Christopher, you're now unmuted. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just comment on what I heard with the budget. Um, I think the proposed police budget is gross, um, over $100 million, making up a fourth of the general fund is just wild to me, uh, especially for a department that just two years ago shot a child with autism. I mean, it feels like we aren't taking anything that's happened not only locally but nationally um, into account with this budget. Um, research is constantly showing that increasing the police budget is not the best way to handle crime and just all of that kind of stuff, homelessness, anything like that, isn't helped by increased police budgets. And we should be taking not just the proposed, like I think it was like 25% increase to the budget, but even more of their budget to help people who are experiencing homelessness, help those who are seeking treatment for mental health and drug problems. All of that would just be a better way to spend this wild amount of money that we're throwing away to the police. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, all right, and then our last commenter was Paul, but I'm not seeing him joining remotely. If he's there in person, um, if not, that was our last commenter. Yeah, Paul's not on this side of the house. Okay. 
Great. That was our last comment. Thank you, Taylor. We'll be moving on to the item J, new business. And we have item J1 regarding the ordinance amendment to rename the Housing and Neighborhood Development Division, HAND, as the Housing Stability Division. I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the, to rename the Housing and Neighborhood Development Division, HAND, as the Housing Stability Division. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Puglia, second from Councilman Petro. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will roll call this. Petro? Yes. Father Mullis? Yes. Mono? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Pui? Yes. Wharton? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously. Item J2, advice and consent, the public Service Department Director Jorge Chamorro. I look for a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Wharton, a second from Councilman Pui. Any discussion on this item? All right, a roll call is Councilman Romano. Yes. Father Morris. Yes. Petro. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Pui. Yes. Fowler. Yes. And I'm a yes. Congratulations, Jorge. We're moving on to item number K, unfinished business. Resolution tentative budget of Salt Lake City, including the tentative budget of the library fund for fiscal year 2022 to 23. I look for a motion. Chair, I move that the council approve a resolution adopting the tentative budget for the Salt Lake City, Utah, including the tentative budget of the library fund for fiscal year 2022 to 23. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Pizzo, second from Council Member Valamoros. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussions, I will roll call this. Council Member Fowler? Yes. Pui? Yes. Orton? Yes. Mono? Yes. Valamoros? Yes. Pizzo? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously. We're now on to the unfinished business item. Hold on a second. Did I excuse this? Uh, I'm finished item number K2 regarding the ordinance of budget amendment number six for fiscal year 2021 to 22. I look for a motion. I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2021 2022 final budget of Salt Lake City, including the employment staffing document. Only four items are shown on the motion sheet. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Puyo, second from Councilman Mono. Any discussion on this item? See no discussions. I roll call this council member Petro. Yes. Morris? Yes. Mono. Yes. Warden. Yes. Hui. Yes. Fowler. Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes. That passes unanimously. Item number uh, K3, tentative. Oh, oh, this is it. Uh, ordinance amending the Salt Lake City Code pertaining to the use of city-owned motor vehicles. It's no longer tentative because we discussed it. <laughs> I look for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the Salt Lake City Code Chapter 2.54 pertaining to the use of city-owned vehicles. Council Second. Chair. Prior to that, I just want to make note that there were some Scribner corrections we need to make in the ordinance that you have in front of you. As long as that is acceptable to your motion of adoption, we'll make those corrections. You time. you would call those clerical corrections, right? Yeah, there are minor grammatical corrections and an, and a year notation correction that we need to make. So there are clerical corrections. One is a year and a couple of grammatical corrections that have been made uh, by the recorder, and those will be corrected by the attorney's office before it's signed. Correct. Okay. So do I have to make a motion to? Nope. Oh. Just she's just disclosing. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So on this item right now, Councilman Pui, you want to just repeat your uh, motion one more yeah. time? Yeah, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the Salt Lake City Code Chapter 2.54 pertaining to the use of city-owned vehicles. Second. 
We have a motion from Councilmember Pui, a second from Councilmember Morton. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussions, I will roll call this Councilmember Romano. Yes. Bella Morris? Yes. Petro? Yes. Morton? Yes. Pui? Yes. Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously. Moving on to item number K4, Parameters Resolutions of Public Utilities Revenue Bond Series 2022. I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move the council adopt the series 2022 bond parameters resolution and recognize the date is, in, is set for public hearing on the bond issuance for May 17th, 2022. Second. A motion for Councilmember Mono, a second from Councilmember Wharton. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion on this item, I will roll call this. Councilmember Mono. Yes. Paul Morris. Yes. Petro. Yes. Fowler. Yes. Louis. Yes. Wharton. Yes. And I'm a yes, that motion passed unanimously. Council Chair, if I could, just for the purpose of the record, confirm that that will also, that parameters resolution also establishes the protest period for that bond. Thank you. No amendment required. I just wanted to make sure it was clear. And is, is that clear to everybody? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to the consent agenda. Move for approval. I'm par sorry, Council Chair. I'll just remind you that there was one board appointment interview that was not completed. Except for? Except for, It would be L6 for the for peanut L6 board. Except for L6 for the peanut board. Second. Right. So I have a motion from Councilman Wharton for approval of the consent, except for L6. I have a second from Councilman Pui. Any discussion on this item? No discussion. I will roll call this Council Member Petro. Yes. Paul Morris. Yes. Mono. Yes. Councilmember Fowler. Yes. Pui. Yes. Orton. Yes. And I'm a yes, and that motion passes unanimously. This concludes our formal city council meeting, but we will, and we'll move into a uh, closed session at this time. I'm sorry. Council Chair, I am chatty tonight, and I apologize <laughs> for that. I must be screwed up. Give me this new microphone. Um, what, because the work, the closed session is listed on your work session agenda, we would appreciate if you would adjourn your formal meeting and we will return to the work session link inside WebEx. So I just need about five minutes okay. before the motion can be made for the closed session. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn. Oh, before we can motion be made. No, adjourn first and then. Adjourn first. Five minutes, we will. Okay, you adjourn it then. So the formal session is adjourned at this time, and we will be coming back in five minutes to continue with a closed session. Yes, thank you. Thank you.